Hello everyone. Welcome to this audio presentation pre-recorded for the 17th annual Chicago Food Justice Summit happening online from February 23rd to 25th, 2022. And the recordings are also available afterwards on YouTube. You can find out more about the summit and register at chicagofoodpolicy.com. My name is Julie Nowak. I use she, her pronouns. And the topic for my presentation today is disability justice. And the title for this presentation is Disability Justice, a Framework for the Food Justice Movement. So before I launch in, I want to give a statement about accessibility. Given that the topic is disability, I really want to center accessibility. The first point is that there is a transcript available for this audio presentation. You can find that wherever you found uh, this audio recording, you will find the transcript available there. There are also optional visual and text materials to accompany this audio presentation if you would like those. They are available on um, the website for Sins Invalid, which is a disability performance art organization that I'm not affiliated with, but they've created wonderful resources about disability justice. So. Uh, if you look at the page where this audio recording is available, there's a link to a list of disability justice principles and descriptions from Sins Invalid. And you can also Google it on your own. If you Google disability justice principles Sins Invalid, you should find them. And Sins Invalid is spelt S-I-N-S-I-N-V-A-L-I-D. So next, a couple points about accessibility. I'm going to do my best to use clear verbal communication. So I will try to not speak too quickly and I will try to define jargon. But of course, you can pause and rewind the recording at any point. And I also encourage you to take care of yourself while you listen and engage in other talks during this summit. Um, I encourage you to pace and pause and remember that all the recordings will be available on YouTube afterwards. So you don't have to feel you have to participate in everything live. And in this presentation, there will be a couple optional individual activities you can participate in or not. It's completely your choice. Uh, and you can pause the recording to do those reflections or continue listening. It's up to you. And while there's no video for this presentation, I still want to give a description of my headshot that was tied to this talk um, in case you can't uh, see that. My photo is a headshot of me. I'm a white person with very short brown hair in a black top and I'm in front of an outdoor background of trees and clouds. I would also like to give a land acknowledgement. Um, colonialism is tied to ableism, and so it's very relevant. I believe it's very important to make disability justice work decolonial. And part of that is knowing uh, who the indigenous people are of the land we live on. And in my case, it was land that was stolen. So I personally live on the indigenous territory of the Anishinaabek, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas of Accredit, which today is known as Toronto in Canada. And I invite you to join me in supporting Indigenous-led initiatives to return land back to Indigenous communities through the Land Back Movement. Uh, a good place to start is to learn where you live yourself, who the Indigenous people are there, and a website to find that information is native-land.ca. Uh, my favorite resource to find out more about the Land Back Movement and Indigenous rematriation of land is a wonderful anonymous Google Doc filled with resources. Um, the link is kind of long, so I won't read it out here, but I have it linked in the transcript. 
and I also have it linked on my own personal website at the bottom of the homepage. My website is seasonalbody.org and there's a link to the Google Doc at the bottom. I'm also going to give a quick agenda of what we will be talking about, but before we do that, I want to invite us in the spirit of taking care of ourselves to take a pause to breathe and ground ourselves in this moment. So I invite you to breathe in and breathe out and breathe in and breathe out. And if you would like a bit more time to get settled and ground yourself, you can pause the recording here. Otherwise, I will be moving on. So the agenda is all around this topic of disability justice and food justice. So I'm going to start by first telling you a brief bit about me. I will then give a, a brief overview of disability justice. I will then talk about specific disability justice principles and invite you to contemplate how your life would look if you were implementing these principles on an individual level and also if our communities were implementing them. I will then talk about how each principle can apply to the food justice movement with some specific examples. And I will then invite you to consider how to apply what you've learned to your own work and lives. And I will finish with sharing a, a few resources and some contact information for me. So let's dive in. So who am I? <laughs> so as I said, my name is Julie Nowak. I am an activist, uh, an, an educator, a writer, and a consultant. I am disabled myself uh, through multiple disabilities. <laughs> I am neurodivergent from brain injury. I have multiple chronic illnesses uh, and a genetic disorder. Um, and so my disabilities are a mix of physical, cognitive, and emotional symptoms. And I have a project called The Seasonal Body, which is specifically exploring the intersection of disability justice, nature connection, body liberation, and food justice. So this comes together well with this conference and uh, wanting to talk about disability justice in relation to food justice. And I came to this work partly as a disabled person who's also worked in the food justice field. Um, and I also bring in the world of body liberation and body positivity, partly based on my own experience of finding healing from disordered eating through therapeutic farming. So that's me. And now I will be giving a brief overview of disability justice and how it's different than disability rights. And you may be wondering, well, well what, what is the difference? So these are both movements that are dedicated to addressing oppression against disabled people. Disability rights is an older movement and the disability justice movement formed more recently in response to the fact that the disability rights movement hasn't been very intersectional. Um, intersectional is a term used in social justice to refer to the fact that we can't really have a single issue way of looking at the world because different identities intersect in different ways. And so the disability justice movement is really trying to center disabled BIPOC, which stands for Black Indigenous People of Color, and also LGBTQ plus folks um, who have often been left out of the disability rights movement, but who often are the recipients of the worst versions of ableism. Um, so now on the topic of ableism, I want to define that term and some other terms that are very relevant to this work. So ableism is typically defined as the oppression of disabled people in our world. And that is definitely true. 
I personally would like to expand that definition to not just refer to specifically disabled people, but more how we are valuing and categorizing and treating people based on their different abilities, capacities. And that affects everyone because I view disability more of a, a spectrum, a fluid spectrum. Most people at some point in their life will experience either short-term or long-term disability and will also um, experience illness and life circumstances that affect their ability and capacities, whether they're overworked, whether they're a caregiver, um, all, kinds of, all kinds of situations. And so really ableism affects everyone because everyone has these uh, pressures on them and discrimination based on what they can and can't do that may not be in line of what is expected of them in a given moment. Um, but of course, disabled people have the most effects from ableism. Uh, another important key term is accessibility, which is a word that gets thrown around a lot. I think some people view accessibility as a checklist. These are the things we're going to do to say this is accessible and then it, and then it's done. This is this is accessible. And I would say that accessibility is not so legalistic or universal or binary. It's not so much this is accessible or not accessible. It's more of a process rather than a destination. And I'm going to give you my definition of accessibility, which is I view accessibility as creatively finding ways to provide a variety of options for participation and viewing all options as full participation and equally valuing any type of participation. And so this requires creativity and flexibility and adaptability and love. And that is so much more than, than a checklist. Of course, checklists can be helpful as a starting point, but ultimately, it's more important to find out what the needs of your community are in order to meet them. And sometimes there may be conflicting needs. Uh, sometimes the needs may change. And so really accessibility is this, this moving process. Now, in terms of terms of how to refer to people who are or aren't disabled, you may have heard a lot of terms thrown around. And I'm not going to cover all those terms, but I will say that the, the two terms that are usually most preferred over other terms is either disabled people or people with a disability or people with a disability. Um, and even with those, there are tensions. So I, I personally, for talking about myself and disability justice, prefer identity first language which is rather than saying I'm a person with a disability, which would be person first language, I'm saying I am a disabled person, which is identity first language. And I won't go into detail too much about why that is. If you would like to learn more about this, why there are some of these tensions, I encourage you to follow other, disab other disabled um, activists online and to learn from them. And a good starting point is to look up the difference between the social model of disability and the medical model of disability. And the typical way disabled people are viewed in our world is the medical model, that a disability is inherent in the person and individual. But the social model of disability says that um, what makes someone disabled is not what's actually going on with their body, but how they are treated by the external world, that that is more what determines whether someone is disabled. And so, for example, someone who needs glasses is not considered disabled because our society makes glasses available to them. And in places where glasses are not available, some folks may actually be disabled who require them. Um, and ultimately, I would like to blur this binary between disabled and not disabled. Um, you may have heard some people use terms like able-bodied, which is a, def a, which is a decent term, um, 
but I generally use the term non-disabled. I just feel it's more of a blanket statement appropriate. Some people feel the term able-bodied only refers to physical abilities and not necessarily other types of abilities, but it's still a decent term to use. Um, but whether I'm using the term non-disabled or able-bodied um, in comparison to a disabled person or a person with disability, there's still this aspect of the fluid continuum. And yes, we can talk about how, uh, with through the lens of the social model of disability, how certain people are disabled by how they're treated in society and things not being accessible to them. And that affects people differently who that is not happening to. But as I said before, ableism affects everyone. And so disability justice is for everyone. And I actually think that disability can save the world as an antidote to so many of the oppressive structures in our world, like capitalism, like colonialism. Um, and I think disability justice has a lot to offer in those areas. So I'm gonna talk more about what those disability justice principles are. But before I do that, I just wanna give one more definition that is for food justice. I'm not gonna go into this at length because this is the topic of the summit uh, and there's so much information in the other talks, I'm sure. But I wanna give you my working definition for food justice so that you know where I'm coming from when I'm talking about it. I define food justice as uh, our movement to make the food system more equitable and sustainable at all levels and for all involved. So that means for the land, for the workers, for the transporters, for the government policies, for the, the eaters, <laughs> for everyone involved. Um, that's where I see um, the world of food justice. And I will talk later about how food justice connects with disability justice. So I am now going to talk about 10 specific disability justice principles outlined by Sins Invalid, um, which as I said, is a disability arts project um, who has really helped form the disability justice movement. And so if you would like visual aids as I go over these principles, you can look at the link I mentioned earlier. I'm going to pull it up myself as well so I can look at it while I talk to you. Um, I'm first just going to list them off and then I will go into them in more detail. And while I list them off, I invite you to think what your initial interpretation is of this principle without any context, just what it means to you based on what you already know. And also to think about what would our world look like if this principle were being embraced by our culture, our communities. And if you would like more time for this, you can pause the recording. So the 10 principles are number one, intersectionality. Two, leadership of those most impacted. Three, anti-capitalist politic. Four, commitment to cross-movement organizing. Five, recognizing wholeness. Six, sustainability. Seven, commitment to cross-disability solidarity. Eight, interdependence. Nine, collective access. And 10, collective liberation. So those are the 10 principles. Uh, and I forgot to mention earlier, so when you go to that link, there are several options available from an accessibility perspective. There are a couple infographics, um, one that lists the principles in fun text, another one that lists them with a brief description. And underneath that, there's a plain text embedded in the website. They also have a PDF available, um, one that is the plain text version that describes one of the graphics, and then another PDF that is a longer version with more detail about each principle. 
So you can check those out. Um, and I will also say on this link, they have a, a link to a disability justice book created by Sins Invalid that I highly recommend. It's called Skin, Tooth and Bone. The basis of movement is our people, a disability justice primer. And you can purchase it either as a hard copy book or as a PDF. Unfortunately, there is no audio book available, but the PDF does work with a screen reader, so you can listen to it being read that way. Okay, so I'm going to go through each of the principles again and give a brief description of what they mean and how they could apply to the food justice movement. Because ultimately what I'm trying to communicate here is that while these are principles for the disability justice movement, I think they would enhance all other social justice movements, help them be more effective, more sustainable, and uh, more compassionate and loving and embracing of, of all people. So let's go through them again. Number one, intersectionality. So as I said earlier, this is a term that refers to the fact that different identities intersect. And so we, can, we can't just focus on disability or just focus on racial justice or just focus on uh, queer rights, that all of these things uh, intersect. And so we need to keep all of them in mind in all of our movement work. And so this includes the food justice world um, and, you know, many others uh, in this summit raised the importance, for example, of including racial justice as a central focus within the food justice world. Um, and so the disability justice world is saying yes, and also we need disabled folks. And we need to be talking about how ableism intersects with white supremacy uh, and capitalism and colonialism and other inequalities. Number two, leadership of those most impacted. So this is fairly self-explanatory that we want the work being done to serve us, to be led by us, um, which is an ask of many marginalized communities. Um, and so we want this as well within the disability justice movement. So often uh, nonprofits that serve disabled folks are not led or even staffing disabled folks themselves. And so that's something we wanna change. And I want us to think about that in the food justice world as well, whether it's a nonprofit or some community uh, initiative, um, we need more disabled folks actually in leadership um, in those roles. And that means we have to make those roles accessible to them. Number three is anti-capitalist politic. So this relates to what I was just saying about making jobs more accessible because one of the core tenets of capitalism is that individuals are valued and evaluated based on their productivity. And of course, this can be true in terms of a capital business perspective, but this also happens in nonprofit activist spaces as well, where there's still this urgency and rush to get things done quickly and to work really, really hard. Um, but the problem with that is that that's not accessible to so many people. And I would actually say that's not accessible to anyone. <laughs> um, it's this capitalistic mindset that then gets applied to social justice work. And so, um, in terms of, for example, making jobs within a food justice organization more accessible, how are we reframing a job to think that's outside of this capitalistic standard that I need to work 40 hours a week or else I'm a bad performer? Um, and that, you know, that's a big thing to tackle on an institutional level. Um, but I want you to just get the balls rolling and, and, and sit with that discomfort. Number four, commitment to cross-movement organizing. 
So this relates to intersectionality and the fact that we need to be working with multiple issues together. Um, it also brings to light the fact that different movements have a lot to offer other movements. And so, um, you know, in terms of food justice, I think what we're hoping within the disability justice movement is that we can learn from you and you can learn from us. Um, and bring a disability justice lens to other movements, including food justice, um, by working together and learning from each other. Number five, recognizing wholeness. So this, this in part relates to the idea that we don't want to value people solely based on their productivity and what they can and can't do. It also relates to the fact that disabled folks are often infantilized and viewed as children because they have particular needs. Um, and we want to embrace a world where regardless of someone's needs, they are viewed as whole people, uh, whole adults um, who are full people living in this world. And uh, yeah, so in terms of food justice, whether you're serving dis disabled folks or serving other types of people, what can we do to make it less of an us and them charity model um, where they may be viewed less of a full person, um, but viewing them as whole people regardless of what they're being um, helped with, what their needs are. Number six is sustainability. And this is not so much referring to environmental sustainability, of, although, of, of course, that's very relevant, but it's referring more to uh, like our sustainability as, as humans, as individuals and as a community in terms of living our lives in a sustainable way and working in a sustainable way and getting away from this concept that we should always be working hard, 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 go, go, go but stepping back and saying, what is actually sustainable for me as an individual, for us as a community? Um, how do we step away from this urgency mindset so that we can actually do our work in a sustainable way, which means we're less likely to burn out, which means we actually may be, be able to get more people involved because this sustainability mindset may mean our work is more accessible to more people. And so while it seems counterintuitive to choose this instead of urgency in the long run it actually means our work can be more effective and is honoring each other more and i think this is hugely moving i i think this is hugely missing from so many movements including food justice um and so i i think this principle in particular has the potential to really revolutionize how we do work. And I think disabled folks have so much to offer and bring to other movements, including food justice in this area. Number seven, commitment to cross disability solidarity. So just as we need to be intersectional between different types of marginalizations. We also need to recognize that different types of disabilities have different needs and are also, also experience ableism in different way. And um, so much of disability rights has really focused on mobility disabilities, which is of course very important and has made so much progress in terms of making places wheelchair accessible, for example. Um, but with our cross disability solidarity work, we really want to also center other types of disabilities that are um, often less understood um, and treated differently, whether that is neurodivergent folks, such as those who are autistic, or folks who are blind or deaf or have uh, sensory disabilities, those who are chronically ill, those who have mental illness, those who have developmental disabilities like Down syndrome, um, those with uh, chemical and environmental sensitivities. All of these need to be at the table. And so in terms of how this applies to food justice work, um, if you are seeking out to have more disabled voices at the table of what you're doing, um, but your only interpretation of making something accessible is wheelchair accessible, then you're not gonna, you may not be reaching these other people.
and you may not actually be bringing in their voices. Number eight is interdependence. Um, and this is the principle that relates most strongly to the theme of the summit, which is collective care. Um, so interdependence is this wonderful concept that challenges that individualistic mindset that is so ingrained in capitalism. But um, uh, individualism is, is, is not real. Um, Non-disabled people have this illusion that they're independent, but they're actually not. Um, they're relying on essential workers and people who run the stores they shop at. Um, even if they're growing their own food, they rely on um, seeds or labor or land. So really we're all interdependent. It's just that non-disabled folks get to have the illusion that they're actually interdependent, but as disabled folks, we don't get that illusion. So we, we, we know we're interdependent and we have to be interdependent. And so that's a, something we can bring to all of our work. Um, and I'm really happy to see that concepts like community care and mutual aid are being talked more about in the food justice world. Um, and I think disability justice can bring even more to that conversation of what it really means to meet each other's needs. Number nine is collective access. So this, this goes back to how I defined accessibility is not just this checklist but really this creative and flexible process um, to make spaces and participation accessible to people um, and really going beyond uh, what we think is quote unquote normal um, so that we can get more people involved. And I think food justice work has, has a lot <laughs> to learn and change in that area in order to, to move towards this idea of collective access. And I think if we can do that, the, the movement will be a lot more effective in their work. Even of course, there um, are, are costs with that, you know? Um, Things like ASL interpreters and live captioners can be quite pricey. Um, so that's where creativity and interdependence come in, where we can kind of crowdsource how to figure that out. And it also means that when we're budgeting, that we center accessibility. And the last principle, number 10, is collective liberation, uh, which kind of sums up what all the other all the other principles are which is that we're we're not leaving anyone behind um that we can move forward in this revolution together with everyone um and we're not leaving people out because we're keeping spaces inaccessible we're not leaving people out because they can't participate in a way that meets our expectations. Um, and so in your own food justice work, I invite you to think about, you know, who's being left out um, in your work. Um, you know, if you if you have a community garden, for example, um, who is not able to actually participate in that community garden? Are there are there raised beds? If not, only people who can bend over and get on the ground are going to be able to participate. So um, that is the end of the list of principles. So what I would like us to do now is to think about how to apply what you've learned here about disability justice principles and how to apply that to your own work, your own life, whatever your involvement in food justice is, whether you work at a nonprofit, whether you're in a leadership role, um, whether you're a student or casual learner, um, whether you're a community organizer, whether you're a recipient of the services of, you know, mutual aid organizations, whatever your role is, I invite you to think about these principles. And as I said earlier, think about how your life and your community would look different if they were, um, if they were being applied and embraced, but I also wanna get more specific. And so after this talk, I invite you um, 
to sit down with this list of principles and go through each one and write examples of how it could apply to your own situation. Um, and I, I don't want you to do this in a judgy way where you're like, oh, I can't believe that um, I'm being capitalistic in this way or whatever. That's not, that's not the point of this. Um, you know, being, being perfectionistic goes against disability justice principles. Um, so we're not trying to be perfectionistic in the process of applying disability justice principles. We need flexibility um, and slowness and calm with that as well. But it's more of just um, the practice of, you know, making connections in our brains about where we may be missing things. Um, and I invite you as well to bring this list of principles to those you're working with, whether that's um, in an employment setting or community organizing or in a school setting, wherever you are engaging with food justice, um, you know, on a conceptual or practical level, I encourage you to bring this list of principles and feel free to share this recording with them and, you know, generate ideas together of you, you know, if you could be completely um, imaginative and envision a future that, is, that completely embraces these principles, what would that look like? And of course, that may not seem realistic at this point in time, but it can be helpful to use that radical imagination to envision a future that is embracing these and then work backwards from there. So, for example, maybe it seems you know, completely unreasonable at this time to um, compensate people differently than based on their output and like a 40 hour work week. Maybe that seems too hard to financially figure out at this point in time. But, you know, you can take baby steps in that area. If you are in a position of um, power in an institution um, and you have a say in um, people's flexibility in their work hours, you know, um, flexible start and end times, different types of break options, um, and getting the ball rolling with more vacation time, more, more paid parental leave, more sick time, um, all of these things, those all are, are baby steps in working towards making workspaces more accessible. Um, so those, those are some things you can, you can think about. Um, and to, to finish off, um, I'm going to recommend once again, that disability justice book created by Sins Invalid, because it has so much more information than what I've shared here and is such a wonderful resource. So again, um, you can find that, um, linked, um, on the page that has the disability justice principles. Uh, you can also search, you can also Google search disability justice primer, sins invalid. And again, that's S-I-N-S-I-N-V-A-L-I-D. And it's available on their website, sinsinvalid.org. And it is called Skin, Tooth and Bone. The basis of movement is our people, a disability justice primer. Uh, and finally, if you want to get in touch with me, I'd be happy to hear from you. Um, I, I would love to receive feedback about this presentation uh, as an educator. I'm always trying to improve in that area, especially if you have feedback about um, how I could make it more accessible in the future. I would love to hear from you. Um, you can contact me either through my website, which is seasonalbody.org or you can contact me through email directly at seasonalbody at gmail.com. Uh, I'm also on social media. I'm at seasonalbody on Facebook and Twitter. And on Instagram, I'm at the seasonalbody. Uh, and some of those are also linked in my bio description. Um, if you are using the platform for the summit, you can find it there. And with that, I will end this here and I uh, invite you to join me in my joy uh, uh, for disability justice as a framework for the world, um, including food justice. Um, and I hope we can reframe disability as something that is not 
negative. It's not a dirty word, but rather it's something that can really help us shift our, our world. All right. Thank you. Bye.